Hello everyone. Well, after I left yesterday, I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do until I was driving my son to our baseball game. I was explaining to him about DNA replication because that's what nerd dads do when they drive their kids to baseball games or other events. We talk about DNA replication or some other seemingly boring concept. I then thought as we were approaching the baseball field that the process of taking one piece of DNA and copying it into two pieces of DNA was kind of like completing a play in baseball or running the bases where you have the batter standing in the batter's box hoping to create a run going from zero runs to one run or one run to two runs or whatever you might have but hoping to increase the total amount of runs just like DNA re replication does for DNA just like in baseball where you need all the players and all the the uh, pieces to fall in place at the proper time and the proper place to make a play DNA replication also requires all kinds of enzymes necessary to go from one piece of DNA to another so we're going to go with this an analogy um, Gabriel was also fairly intrigued by this idea, or he might have just been trying to shut me up because I couldn't quit talking about it. But as we were playing the game, Gabriel had several comments related to DNA replication and that I decided to insert into this podcast as we move through uh, our understanding of DNA replication. As I said before, much like a piece of DNA waits to be increased into multiple copies of DNA, Gabriel, or any batter, but in this case Gabriel, is standing at the plate hoping to increase the number of runs by his ability to stand there and with all the pieces in proper place to, to um, generate that run. So let's take a look at this video. Oh, there you go. Okay, we'll come back to Gabriel in a bit to see if he is successful at increasing the number of runs. But let's go back and think about DNA as it's being replicated. All right, now let's look at replication a little bit more uh, closely at the molecular level. So here's our DNA molecule. I'm drawing it the other orientation now. And it opens up like so to begin to make new DNA. And it opens up like so in, in, in such a way that we call this the replication fork. So I'm going to, but this is our replication fork right here. This whole thing is called the replication fork. I guess I could put REP in front of it just to remind us what we're looking at here. Now, in, in bacteria, maybe I'll draw a little structure here. Bacteria's chromosomes are circular. And so, when it begins to make DNA, it just has one replication for, well actually two, one going each way. But there's only one origin of replication right there. Okay, now, in eukaryotes, our chromosomes are so much larger, and I'll just draw something like this. They're, they're immensely bigger than what the bacterial chromosomes are, even though this picture doesn't really uh, justify the, the size differences. But because of that, in order to replicate all the DNA in a timely manner, there are multiple origins of replication in eukaryotes, particularly organisms like humans. Even though there are differences, such as the differences of origins of replications, it's important to recognize that the process of replication is the same in bacteria versus eukaryotes. There's very few differences. It uses the same kinds of proteins, the same kinds of enzymes. So let's talk about some of these enzymes real quick then. We're only going to talk about a few of them, but recognize there are many more than what we're going to talk about here in, in this chapter. You'll get much more of this as you move into cell biology and genetics. The first enzyme we're going to talk about is helicase. And what helicase does, I'm just going to pop it right here at the opening of the fork. And I'm just going to put an H here, but that's for helicase. It sort of acts like a buzz saw. It moves down the double helix. And remember, I haven't drawn them here yet, but let's go ahead and draw some, some hydrogen bonds. So the hydrogen bonds between the complementary bases. You should know what the complementary bases are from your reading between the A's, G's, C's, and T's. Now what helicase will do is that it will rip down through the double um, strands of the, heli uh, of the double stranded um, helix and break all of these hydrogen bonds, rips them apart like a bus saw. And it does so in such a way to open up the DNA fork exposing the single stranded 
copies of, of the DNA molecule. Well, let's catch up with Gabriel as he's running to first and see what he thinks about helicase. Helicase on Vine's DNA? I don't get it. Gabriel, right, not right now. You gotta get to first base. They're gonna get you out. Well, that's okay, Gabriel, if you don't quite understand what helicases do yet. You will by the time you reach home, I suspect. Now, let's go ahead and look at some of the other enzymes involved in DNA replication. The first are single-stranded binding proteins. Single-stranded binding proteins, what they will do is they will bind to the single strands of DNA. It's probably the only enzyme we will ever encounter that has the perfect name um, that describes its function. So, single-stranded binding proteins. And that's literally what they do. They bind single-stranded pieces of DNA, and they do so to prevent these two strands from coming back together. Single strands of DNA naturally want to come right back together, but if you can clog them up with these proteins here, it'll prevent these uh, strands of DNA to come back together. Remember, we want to keep them separated so that we can um, make new, new DNA copies using this strand here as our template. Remember, the semi-conservative model says that we're going to maintain, conserve half of our DNA molecules. Now let's talk about another enzyme called topoisomerases. Your book calls them topoisomerases, and that's the eukaryotic version of it. But in that bacteria, what it's called are gyrases. We'll stick with topoisomerases, but you should know that there's a distinction between a topoisomerase and gyrases. So a topoisomerase, what it will do is it'll bind the DNA. And, and what happens here is as the, the helicase is breaking these bonds of, of, of these hydrogen bonds, the strand, the DNA strand, will begin to kink up. If you were to take a cord and hold it tight at one end and spin it around and then begin to pull it apart, maybe we'll do that in class just to kind of show you what I'm talking about, what happens is that this DNA molecule will begin to stretch and eventually it'll break. What the topoisomerases do, let me put a T here so we don't forget that this is topoisomerases, it will literally cut the DNA and allow the helicase to unwind it without putting any extra stress on the DNA molecules themselves. So what they essentially do is they keep them from breaking. Okay, and a quick little side note here. As I said, in eukaryotes, it's a topoisomerase. So let's just write T for topoisomerase, and that's what we find in eukaryotes. Now, bacteria, they use a, an enzyme that does the exact same job, but it's a little different, and it's called a gyrase. I'll go ahead and spell that one because it's not in your book. It's G-Y-R-A-S-E. Well, as Gabriel is rounding first base and heading to second base, let's see what his thoughts are on topoisomerases. Good thing that there's gyrases or our DNA will break. Say! Well, that's very good, Gabriel, but remember that gyrases are found in bacteria and topoisomerases are found in organisms like humans. But you are correct that they both do a very similar function. Now hurry up and get to second base. All right, now there's two more, well, there are three more enzymes we need to talk about. The first is called a primase. And what primases do is they lay a little piece of nucleotides. It's actually, it turns out it's RNA, but that's not important for right now. It, this is RNA that's laid down. And the reason that this is important is because um, well, let's back up for one second. This RNA primase, let me put a P here, and let me back up one second. This is an RNA primer, and when I just lay down the word primer here. So it lays down this primer, and the reason it does this, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up one more second. It does so by using an enzyme called primase, and let's just go ahead and put a circle here with a little P here for primase. That's the name of the enzyme that lays this primer down. Now the reason it does that is because another enzyme called RNA polymerase will bind right here. But it can't bind to DNA by itself. It's unable to do that. So it has to bind to this RNA primer. When it binds to this RNA primer, it can begin to synthesize DNA. In this particular side, it's going to go in this direction. So as the helicase opens up the strands and makes single-stranded uh, pieces of DNA, the DNA polymerase, and I'm just going to write D polymerase here, so we remember that that's the DNA polymerase, it will move along here adding DNA, and I'm going to show the D new DNA as being black. It is indeed amazing that these DNA polymerases continue to make more DNA over and over and over again. 
Gabriel, what do you think about that? Gabriel, they overthrew it! Run, run, run! Go to third! Indeed, it does blow my mind sometimes too. Now hurry up, get on to third base. The end product of what we're drawing here is going to look something like this. For, and I'm just going to show the top strand right now. So here's the new strand that was just formed, and here's the original strand. This is our finished product. Okay, if you notice up here, as I drew the RNA, I'm sorry, the DNA polymerase, and it was moving towards the replication fork and it made doing the DNA going in this one direction. It's doing this in part because of the polarity of the DNA. And so let me go ahead and write the word 3 prime here and 5 prime here. The enzyme reads the DNA in a 3 prime to 5 prime direction. The new DNA that's being made is, is the reverse because one of the rules of DNA is that it's always anti-parallel. So the new DNA is 3 prime and on one end and 5 prime here. I'll just scribble that in here. Okay, now because of this, what happens is this other parental strand here has to be in the opposite direction. It has to go 3 prime to 5 prime. So that creates a slight problem because it still reads it in a 3 prime to 5 prime direction. So what happens is that this piece of DNA laid, laid the primer down and then uh, made new DNA through here. And then the fork opens up a little bit more and you put a primer here and it lays new DNA down like so. And every time the, the fork opens up, it has to lay down a new primer with the primase and then the DNA polymerase adds more DNA. And, and the result of that is, and let's just draw this down here, something we call, well there are these little fragments. The black, remember, is the new DNA that's just been laid down, and the red is the old piece of DNA, the original piece of DNA. And so what, what we call these are Okazaki fragments. I'm just going to put OF for Okazaki fragments. So we are in product, our two new pieces of DNA. However, this piece of DNA down here, we have these big gaps in them, and we can't have those gaps because that would not be uh, sustainable for, for the DNA. So our final enzyme that we're going to talk about, we're finally there, and I think I'm officially out of new colors. I take that back. I still have the color gray, so we'll use gray here. This enzyme is called DNA ligase, DL for DNA ligase. And what, what it does, so DNA ligase, it will bind to the DNA, shown here, and fill in these gaps. It'll fill in each of these gaps between each of the Okazaki fragments. So the end result now is two fully formed um, DNA molecules that will then get packaged into uh, a new cell when the cell divides. Now that you have learned about all these enzymes involved in DNA replication, remember that these enzymes have to be present at the right time for the correct duration and the right location in order to copy the DNA as it should be. It's also important to note that these enzymes are very fast acting. We have well over a billion base pairs that need to be copied. And in order to copy these in an efficient way, uh, these enzymes must move really fast. Go Gabriel, go, 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 they overthrew it. Good thing that enzymes work so fast for we copy our DNA. Gabriel, Gabriel, you can't talk about this now. We'll talk about it after. They're gonna throw you out at home plate. Look, the catcher has the ball. Jackson, who can just unzip your jeans? Ah, you finally understand the DNA helicases. Indeed, the DNA helicases are one of the first enzymes involved, and they do, and they do literally come in there and unzip the DNA molecules. Nice job, buddy. Ninja!